and they escaped to South America, or Colombia, South America. And after two years, they immigrated to the United States. The family moved to Jacksonville, Florida when B was six. She grew up in Jacksonville and was educated from first grade through college in Jacksonville, graduating with a master's degree from the University of North Florida. She retired from a career in health insurance and medical practice management and now lives in Daytona Beach. And she's come all this way to join us tonight. To please help me welcome each other. As early as April 1933, 
The first major law to limit Jewish participation in German public life was enacted. It became known as the Civil Service Law and prohibited Jews and often other non-Aryans from state service and participation in organizations, professions, and other aspects of public life. Laws between 1933 and 1938 were also passed, restricting Jewish students from German schools and universities, including medical schools. They excluded Jews from medical and legal professions. They disallowed Jewish doctors from treating non-Jewish patients and stopped paying Jewish doctors from state health insurance funds. Trade between non-Jewish Germans and Jews was prohibited. In 1934, Jewish actors could no longer perform on stage or screen. The house in which I was born in Kronheim was on the main street that ran through town. The front was our living quarters, and the back part was the synagogue, where my father officiated as religious teacher and cantor at Jewish Sabbath services, holidays, and festivals. From inside our home, we could hear the goose-stepping Nazis as they marched down the street and the rumble of military vehicles. There were two entrances to the house. The front entrance was used by the family. The entrance to the synagogue was on one side. On that side, there were three beautiful stained glass windows that ran from the first to the second floor of the synagogue. There was a Catholic church a few doors down. The parish priest, Father Wagner, and my father were good friends and often took long walks together, deeply involved in theological conversation. Father Wagner, who lived across the street from us, reported in his diary that some unidentified thugs threw rocks at the stained glass windows of the synagogue and smashed them. Many years later, when I read that, I thought, oh my goodness, I was there when that happened. I was three years old. I don't remember the incident, but according to Father Wagner's diary, it happened in August 1936, the year after the Nazi Nuremberg laws were enacted. On September 15, 1935, Within two and a half years after Hitler came to power, the Nuremberg Laws were issued. They were designed, first of all, to deprive Jews of their German citizenship. Even those who had been born in Germany and had roots going back many generations. Like my mother's family, whose family tree goes back in Germany to the 1700s. And they included those Jews who had served honorably in the armed forces and those who served Germany in countless other ways. Jews were no longer allowed to vote or hold public office. They could no longer get medical care at non-Jewish clinics or hospitals from non-Jewish doctors or be treated by any non-Jewish health care practi practitioners. The Nuremberg Laws prohibited Jewish households from employing German female domestic workers under the age of 45. They not only outlawed marriage between a non-Jewish German and a Jew, they prohibited any close relationships between Jews and non-Jewish Germans. Kronheim was a small village in an agricultural area surrounded by farms and dairies. My mother would buy milk, butter, eggs, and other farm products from a neighboring farmer's wife. When it became illegal for non-Jewish merchants to sell to Jews, my mother told the woman she would no longer buy from her in order not to put her in danger. The farmer's wife, however, courageous and righteous as she was, insisted on supplying our family with food. At great risk 
and so that no one would know. She would come in the dead of night, hide the items under the back doorstep of our house, and collect the money my mother had hidden there for her. This was a time when the German people were instructed to report anything they saw that was not in compliance with the new laws. School children were to report to their teachers any illegal activity, even those committed by their own parents. Some children did indeed report their parents, and stories about children who had to watch as one or both parents were dragged off to concentration camps were whispered among the villagers. Those people who did not agree with Nazi policies and who, like the farmer's wife, came to the aid of Jewish families, did so at great peril, not only to their freedom, but to their very lives. They were indeed righteous and courageous people who are to this day honored at museums like Yad Vashem in Israel and the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. They're known as righteous among the nations. They live on in the hearts and minds of millions of people who know their stories. According to Jewish dietary laws, animals certified for kosher consumption must be killed in the most humane and clean way. In my father's profession, in addition to his credentials of teacher and rabbinical leader of the Kronheim congregation, he was also certified to slaughter chickens and cattle for kosher meat. Kosher in Hebrew means clean. Early in the 1930s, when the Nazi regime passed a law forbidding the slaughter of animals for Germany's Jews, it meant that kosher meat would no longer be available to them. One day, my father was teaching in Heidenheim a small town nearby, when a woman arrived at the site. She held out a sack of live chickens and asked my father to slaughter them for her family. During their conversation, in which my father was explaining to the woman that it would be illegal for him to do what she asked, three Nazi policemen stormed in and accused him of violating the law and threatened to arrest him. My father denied breaking the law and showed them the sack of live chickens. He also showed his Hungarian passport. The Nazis left without making the arrest. His passport was confiscated and he was told he was being deported to Hungary. He had been summoned to the Nazi district office. Since he was born in Hungary, he was not considered a German citizen even before the Nuremberg Laws. He had lived and was educated in Germany for, from early childhood, but was a Hungarian national with a Hungarian passport. The following month, he received his passport and orders to be out of Germany in four weeks. My mother, my sister, and I were scheduled to join my mother's sister and family who were fleeing to Holland to escape the Nazis. Had we joined my aunt and family in Amsterdam, I would not be here to tell this story. They, along with an estimated 140,000 Jews, were deported to the camps when the Nazis overran the Netherlands. My aunt and uncle, their teenage daughter and her aunt, were exterminated in the death camp of Sobibor. Feeling that the safest place to be was off the European continent, my father immediately began searching for a country that would accept Jews. At the Council of Immigration in Munich, he saw a brochure that advertised possible refugee acceptance in Colombia, South America. The council officer, who was not a Nazi, wrote the refugee organization in Cali, Colombia, on my father's behalf. And within two weeks, word came 
that they would provide assistance to our family. After contacting several government offices, my father was successful in obtaining a four-month extension. The German officer who issued the permission to stay the extra three months had my father close the door to his office so the Nazi secretary in the outer office would not hear, and he said, and he secretly prepared the papers that would allow my father to leave Germany with his family instead of being deported to Hungary. When we left Germany in April 1937, I was almost four years old. Some memories of Kronheim are those I remember, and some that were told to me by family members. One vivid memory that I do remember was of the fire that we were all watching one night from one of the upstairs windows of our house. The home of our neighbors two doors down was burning to the ground. I remember vividly the bright orange flames exploding upward into the night sky. In later years, when I related this memory to my father, he was amazed because he said I was only two when that happened. He told me the firemen were dancing in the street in front of the burning house, blowing on their trumpets, making no effort to stop the fire. The house was owned by Jews. It was 1935, the year of the Nuremberg Laws. This is one example of how rigidly and enthusiastically these laws were enforced. The refusal of the village firemen to make any attempt to put out the flames that were consuming this Jewish family's home foreshadowed what would become known as the Holocaust. On April 24, 1937, the SS Caribbean left Hamburg, Germany with our family on board. What I remember about the long walk to the ship from our hotel was how tired I was, how I begged to be carried, but no one could carry me. When we got to our stateroom, one last indignity was visited upon us. Every trunk, suitcase, and hand luggage that had been delivered to our cabin had been opened and all the contents dumped in the middle of the floor. Nazi officers were <coughs> rummaging, excuse me, <coughs> Nazi officers were rummaging through our belongings. Suspecting smuggling of foreign currency, gold, and other valuables, they searched through everything and confronted my parents. My mother was a very gutsy lady who was very skilled with needle and thread. She had secretly sewn a few pieces of jewelry into some of her clothing. She never told a soul until much later fearing her secret would somehow be revealed. Imagine how terrified she must have been while her belongings were being rummaged through by these Nazis. Finding nothing, they left the ship empty-handed, and at 6 o'clock p.m., the ship sailed. With huge sighs of relief, my parents, my sister and I, watched the, learn the German land disappear in the distance. There were feelings of sadness, however, to leave family and friends in the face of current oppression and atrocities that would later become known as the Holocaust. I celebrated my fourth birthday on the ship with a surprise party arranged by the crew in the dining hall. Interestingly enough, the ship's line and crew were not Nazis they were German, but they were not Nazis, and they treated the Jewish families on board with respect and kindness. They provided kosher food and attended to the needs of the Jewish passengers graciously. On May 20th, 1937, the SS Caribbean docked in Buenaventura, Colombia, South America. The voyage had taken 27 days. My father, who was a gifted linguist, took that time to teach himself Spanish, which was a great help when we arrived, 
the rest of us not understanding a word that was being said as we made our way to our destination. Dog activity was fascinating to me at age four. Stevedores were yelling at one another to move crates and wares from ship to shore. There were vivid colors and the smells of foreign fruits, vegetables, and other exotic foods that swung from huge nets overhead were intensified by the heat of the equator. This is the scene that greeted us as we arrived in this strange new country. We lived in Cali, Colombia two years under difficult circumstances from my parents. During that time, my sister and I learned to speak Spanish fluently. She started school. I played outside every day with neighborhood kids. But there was no work for my father. He barely supported the family by building furniture and doing odd jobs, a carpentry skill that he had learned as a young man in Germany. The Jewish community grew from the 50 when we arrived to an estimated 400 as other refugees poured into Kali. Using his teaching and rabbinical skills, my father organized a functioning congregation, all without a salary, since the Jewish community had no funds to pay him. After two years in Kali, my mother's brother, my Uncle Joe, helped obtain a non-quota visa for us to come to the United States. He had been fortunate to immigrate from Germany directly to the U.S. with his family and eventually was able to find a sponsor for us. We arrived at the Port of New York in March 1939. My sister, two years older than I, and I were running up and down in this huge barn of a structure trying to keep warm while our parents were busy with customs and immigration. When we arrived in the U.S., my sister and I had heard about the Statue of Liberty, and we wanted to see it as the ship sailed into New York Harbor. We asked our mother to get us up if we were sleeping, because the ship arrived between 4 and 5 in the morning. Mother didn't have the heart to wake us. So we missed the opportunity, and it's something I've wanted to do ever since. Finally, in 2004, at age 71, I happened to be in New York. I got on a tour boat headed for the Statue of Liberty. The overwhelming emotion I experienced seeing that magnificent symbol of freedom from the point of view of an arriving immigrant is one I shall never forget. Elie Wiesel, in the preface of his book, Night, wrote, Having survived, I needed to give some meaning to my survival. He needed to tell his story. While I am not a concentration camp or a death camp survivor, I understand that need, and I'm here to tell my story. It doesn't hold a candle to the stories told by survivors who went through the horrors of the Holocaust. But maybe something in my experience will resonate with current and future generations and do two things. Keep the true history of the Holocaust alive and encourage those who hear my story to speak out against prejudice and against the mistreatment of another human being. She's more than willing to take them, and we'll come to you with a microphone so that she can easily hear you. Do you have any questions tonight? I'll be right there. Hi. Ma'am, have you visited Israel, and when? Yes. Uh, the question is, have I visited Israel, and when? Uh, the first time I went to Israel was actually in uh, the summer of 1981. And um, it happens that uh, I have two first cousins and their families that live in Israel. They were able to get to Israel uh, before, uh, you know, 
just before. In fact, I have I have two cousins. Both of those cousins were in Germany during the night of broken glass for Stalin. They told me their stories, which was very interesting. Uh, so I, I visited them, and uh, then I, the last time I went was, um, I guess now six years ago, and I was amazed at the difference and at the progress that the Israelis have made with the technology and so on. So I have been to Israel, and I'm very happy that I was able to be there. Um, I just have a quick question. With your family being able to escape, did they stay in touch or were able to contact any family members or friends in the village that you grew up or were initially born? Actually, there were very few members of our family that did come out. Uh, most of them actually were uh, exterminated. In the town that I grew up in, in Kornheim, we didn't have any family actually living there, but uh, my father's congregation was made up of people who were very, very close friends of my family's. And the children were able to be transported out of Germany uh, on the, the kinder transport. They went to England. And I think that was actually done by the English government, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, but the parents who could not make it out were also exterminated. Uh, there is one story that I'll share with you. Uh, the parents of two of these children that, that I have been in touch with since then uh, were hidden by a woman who was their helper, their housekeeper for many, many years. And she, you know, they were like one family. She and her family hid uh, these two parents of uh, friends that uh, in their, they had a farm and they hid them for a while. And, but someone apparently was getting ready to tell the authorities that they were hiding Jews. And of course, if they were hiding Jews, they were also going to go to concentration camp. And this couple gave themselves up to keep from getting this other family in trouble. And that's that story from the Pornhub. And you know, when I went back, I went back and uh, 2000 to Kronheim. I wanted to get back to my roots. And uh, the, the people in, in Kronheim were always very, very wonderful to everybody. Uh, there's an archaeologist and a historian who's written a book about the three major religions in Kronheim and how uh, they got along so well together. And so when I went back there, uh, I actually was able to go into the, to the house that I was born in, staying in the room that I was born in. And, uh, <clears throat> and, but the, and the people were very kind and very nice. And so most of the people in Kronheim did not, I don't think they were Nazis. We have one coming that way for you. We have a lot of questions, but I probably won't be able to uh, ask them all. One thing I would like to know, did you know about Corey Tien Boone uh, and how she and her family were helping the Jewish, Jewish people escape atrocities? Uh, actually, no, because uh, Corey Tien Boone was in Amsterdam. She was in Holland. And of course, we never got to Holland. So no, I, I never knew her or anybody. I didn't read about her. I have I have read about her and the wonderful uh, things that she did to help the Jewish people. What did your family as immigrants to this country do to make a life for themselves after they arrived here, socially, uh, professionally? Uh, well, you know, um, my parents, when, when we came here in 1939, uh, the first thing that my parents did was learn to speak English. 
They made sure that they were functioning in the community. And when, when five years had elapsed and they were able to obtain citizenship, they immediately got their citizenship. So they were very, very, first of all, we were all very grateful to be in the United States where we have the freedom to worship as we please here. Uh, uh, and, and my father uh, was employed as a, uh, the, as, as a shochet, which is a, a Hebrew word, which means this, to slaughter the uh, chickens and cattle for kosher meat. And he was hired by, there was a, Culture market in Jacksonville, Florida. We arrived in the port of New York and we lived up there for about six months. But we came to Jacksonville and he was actually employed uh, in that capacity in Jacksonville. And he was also very active in religious life there. He also was a teacher. And, uh, and, and my mother, uh, who also learned to read, write, speak English as quickly as possible. This is what, what actually happened was that when my sister and I went to school, we would come home from school and we announced, we would not have, when, when our parents would speak to us in German, we announced we would not speak to them in German, we would only speak to them in English. Which is what we did and, and, and my parents, both of them, learned to read, write, speak English fluently. We probably have time for about one more question. Oh, a few more. Uh, they will try to get you out. Was your, was your father synagogue desecrated during the last night? And you, or were you too young to have any memories of that? Um, uh, did everybody hear that question? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Actually, no. The house is as I remembered it when I went back. The only difference is that what was the synagogue, uh, the Nazis had destroyed everything in it and turned it into a chicken farm. And I found out about that when I went back in 2000 and uh, it was uh, the man who wrote the book that I told you about, the historian and archeologist told me that history about the house. Uh, so it was not, but, but you know, I have pictures of the house where the three, where the three stained glass windows had been, which were like boarded up. But um, as far as the house itself, it's still standing. I want to thank you for coming out today and I really appreciate the history. I would like